people here on a Sunday. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to be talking in a quite different way from the previous speakers. And I've been asked to look very practically at, so what do you do? This isn't about open access advocates talking to other open access advocates. It's about what do you do when you're in a university and you're working with very deeply entrenched academic cultural practices. And until very recently, anything that had the word open sounded like evangelism talk. It's only with the policy environment changing that this has really um, infiltrated academics' consciousness. So that's really going to be the, the focus of what I'm talking about, is how does one engage with these issues in a university? And you'll see from the example here at UCT, our context is specific. But every context is specific. That's the point. Every single person's context is specific. And what we've decided to do, what we've been doing at UCT, is take a holistic approach. So in fact, we're not only talking about open access. We're talking about open education resources. We're talking about open practices. We're talking about open data. We're talking about open scholarship, in fact. And this is really important because the journal articles that we've been focusing on in our discussions to date, and Eve alluded to this, are actually only one part of the opening scholarship terrain. And in the African context, they're a very small part. And open scholarship practices happen throughout the scholarship cycle, right from the very beginning, from conceptualization, right through data, data analysis, data findings. In our context, what's known as gray literature is often a really important part of sharing of outputs, often more important than journals. And what's going on in the open education terrain has really hit the news recently with um, all the activities around MOOCs, the open um, online courses, since the big prestigious universities have got involved with those. So really that's been our take on engaging with these issues. What I'm going to talk about is how we have been engaging with these changing practices. How does one deal with change in a university like the University of Cape Town? And here I have found McNay's um, categories of institutional cultures, higher education institutional cultures, very useful. He suggests two axes, policy definition from loose to tight, and control of implementation from loose to tight. And he suggests that there are four types of institutional cultures as a result. A bureaucratic one which has um, both uh, Oh, I think my axes are the wrong way around. A bureaucratic institutional culture is your, is your worst case scenario. And we could think of many examples in the South African example where academics are told what to do and implementation is very tight. A corporate culture is one which is much more driven by commercial considerations. McNay argues for an enterprise culture. What we have at the University of Cape Town is, is your collegium, your collegial culture. And at the heart of a collegial culture is academic autonomy. Which means that arguing for policies to require open access would be more or less a waste of time. I know this is a contentious thing to say, and I do think that supportive policies would be incredibly useful. But in a collegium culture, requiring academics to do anything that they don't buy into is not really worth doing in our experience. So really the approach that we are taking is a persuasive one. 
the argument is far more important. Even in situations where policy uh, requirements are put in place, a kind of passive, aggressive compliance is more likely to occur. And this has been found to be the case not only in the open education arena, but in other educational technology arenas as well. So the collegium type is characterized by loose policies, informal <coughs> networks, informal decision-making nodes, and innovation at the level of the individual. That's, that's what we work with. That's the reality. Some people say this is laissez-faire. It's premised on external controls not having huge power. And something I might also add is it also acknowledges the role of disciplinary cultures. And I think it's really important that for many academics, their um, allegiance is far more likely to be to their discipline and their disciplinary <coughs> cultures than to their institution. I think this is very important for open access advocates to bear in mind. So here we are at the University of Cape Town. It's a top-ranked South African university. We're high up. We're proud of the fact that we ranked so highly in so many different rankings and so many different ways. We're medium-sized. We've got a small permanent academic uh, staff. We've got a number of Nobel Prize laureates, Booker Prize winners, important uh, research initiatives. We regard ourselves as a global university. Teaching is residential, face-to-face. -face. The MOOCs uh, initiative that I mentioned earlier is the first time I would say that um, the open agenda has really uh, hit the online space in terms of the discussions in the university. What we do have is a strong history of activism around academic development through the work in the Centre for Higher Education Development. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the work around open education actually arose in that space. Because we know that the reasons people get involved with open access and open education are often around social development and access to knowledge. It's often an activist space. This is a summary of the work that's been done around openness at the University of Cape Town. It's all been innovation funded by external funders. It started with an initiative in 2007, which Eve Gray, who spoke earlier, led, looking at all three areas of openness, scholar to scholar, scholar to student, and scholar to community in the university, and it found that, in fact, there was a great deal of activity going on in an ad hoc and fragmented way. This led to the Open Education Resources Project. And as you'll see when I show you some of the work that's been done, the University of Cape Town is extremely unusual in that the open access movement, in fact, was not the leader of the open practices movement. This work started in open education resources and open education practices. At the same time, the health sciences led the way with an extremely supportive dean working with the universities of Michigan and, um, and in Ghana on a health sciences open education resources unit um, project. And then the UCT Knowledge Co-op was also funded to work with um, community engagement with the university. <coughs> Where we are now is a three-year funded project, the Open UCT Initiative, which I'm leading. And we have two purposes. The one is to get in place systems that will enable the sharing of as much scholarly content as possible. So that which is shareable legally um, in terms of ethics, um, in terms of what people are prepared to share. 
but the other is to engage the university community in these debates. And this is where the question of institutional culture is absolutely critical. This is the, uh, the uh, website where we have a blog which aggregates blog postings around these issues. Anyone here would like to do a guest blog for us? You're very welcome to talk to me during tea time. Um, and as you'll see, we have a number of outputs, a number of events, um, etc. The, the, the usual sorts of things you would expect. So how are we approaching the issues in our, given our context? We've got some key principles. The first is individual agency and control. The second is maximum flexibility. The third is networking and community building. The fourth is enabling, not requiring. So my understanding of governance, when I argue for governance, it's to create an enabling environment to make certain behaviors desirable, not to police and monitor. Advocacy, champions and incentives, and also researching practices. We actually need to understand what's going on. As I mentioned, this work started in the open education resources space in CHED. And we acknowledge the need for multiple strategies. There is no one size fits all solution. We're hoping that these pockets of activity that exist throughout the university will agglomerate. And in fact, we are seeing instances where that is happening. And we're working through all levels in the institution, from the senior leadership group to students, <coughs> right through the system. In terms of academic agency, we're enabling academic uploading of resources. And we're trying to build systems to make this as easy as possible. We're assuming that the quality assurance lies with the academics, that they are the ones who know what good quality is. We're not building quality assurance mechanisms into a system within the institution. The moderation is largely around uh, legal issues, and this is particularly relevant in the teaching space, and particularly around images, for example. We're taking a very flexible approach. As I said earlier, this is not just about journal articles. This is about sharing all types of content. And some people start very nervously. One must remember that people are anxious, threatened, fearful. Um, somehow or other, it's OK to give things to students, but if anyone else sees it, that's much more scary. So sometimes people start with quite small sharing of resources, and that's absolutely fine. We've often seen that those small resources are the ones that get taken up or translated into other language or used in different ways, and that gives people confidence to share and provide more resources. And the only way that an, initi an initiative like this can work is by massive networking both within and outside the university. Every single part of the university is involved in an initiative that makes visible the scholarly work of the university. The IP law unit, central at the heart of this work, is intellectual property. The knowledge co-op I've mentioned, citizen science projects, which are growing in, for example, the animal demography unit, huge amount of data coming in from people who are in the community, work in e-research, the library, the communications office, and of course, last but absolutely not least, the faculties, the academics themselves. Everyone has to be involved to make this work. We're very fortunate that our work is enabled by 
an institutional IP policy which acknowledges open licensing and broader views of intellectual property. One of the major strands to our activities is advocacy work. And this involves both the popular media, the media within the university, but also committee work. In universities, real change happens in committees. It happens in corridors, but it happens in committees. And being in the right meetings and inserting the right discussions is absolutely critical. And of course, it happens through events. So on the bottom of that slide, you'll see the events that we hosted during Open Access Week. It's also about identifying champions. What you have there is an image of our Vice Chancellor signing the Berlin Declaration last year. But the thing is that a university such as the University of Cape Town, the Vice Chancellor signing the Berlin Declaration is symbolic. It's a fabulous, fabulously symbolic but it's not going to make an academic in this institution do anything differently unless they believe in what the objective is. And so I think probably the most critical work is actually discussing those objectives at great length. As I mentioned, identifying champions, the Dean of Health Sciences has been a wonderful champion. And bringing the work of early adopters above the radar. In fact, what our early work found was that a number of academics in the university were already sharing resources. But they were doing it in a way that didn't make that work discoverable. So there is a whole level of technical work that's really important around discoverability, around how to put resources online in ways that can be found and about doing research which looks at how people find resources. The truth of the matter is most people find resources through search engines. And this is the kind of information that we need and that we need to keep track on, track of. I think I've said most of this, except for the fact that we're seeing the rise of something that I think is very interesting, the non-professional expert. As resources go online, more and more people are involved in sharing resources. And that is something that we're having to tap. We have enablers, thanks to the Mellon Foundation, we are able to provide small grants to people who would like to share resources. And to date, in the last 15 months, we've been able to give 35 small grants. They're up to 10,000 Rand. And once again, as I said earlier, they are for a range of activities. Our latest round of grants include students who are able to turn resources into shareable resources. As long as they have an academic who is prepared to sign off on the quality, we are finding that students are often the most ardent advocates because they're starting to realize that when they leave the university, they lose access to resources. And as you can see, interestingly, and in contrast to some of the representation earlier, we're finding that our, uh, many of our grants are going to the humanities. It's not only in the sciences. And we're absolutely committed to researching practice. It's understanding what's going on that is so important to doing this work because any work that involves change and has a tendency toward evangelism has also got a tendency towards glib statements. And this undermines our credibility and I think having solid research is absolutely critical. I've only got a couple of minutes left, I know. So I'm going to go very briefly through how we've been doing to date. And basically, we have slowly, through our open content directory, which we're in the process of changing to a repository and a directory, 
been seeing slow, solid growth. And we believe that it is the so, slow, solid growth that is more likely to be long-term and long-lasting. Not surprisingly, most of our hits are coming from South Africa, but they're coming from all over the world. Almost every country in the world has accessed one or more of our resources. As I mentioned, the number one referrer is the search engine, Google. Number one. After that, the UCT website, and then after that, it drops dramatically. This is really important in, make, in terms of making resources findable. And the growth of resources is slowly increasing, bit by bit. A range of faculties are involved and a whole range of resources. Interestingly, yesterday, or on Friday, I was in a meeting where the latest grants were discussed and we're seeing the rise of videos and podcasting as bandwidth becomes more prevalent in our institution. So really, to end off, I'd like to say that our approach is a steady upswell. I think until the policy environment in the north changed, that was the, the thing that was going to um, be the only route. I think uh, the tsunami in the global north is going to finally uh, ebb our way, if I can stretch the metaphor somewhat. Um, we are working with integrating our activities into existing structures. We accept that this is an organic process. And we believe that a slow process where people buy into what we're doing is much more likely to be sustainable and effective in the long term with a research-based approach to inform our strategy. Thank you. Hi, Cara Daniels from Medical Research Council. I just wanted to know what kinds of things um, people are sharing. I mean, you've, you've, I mean, you've said it's webs, you know, like web things and documents and so on, but what kinds, is it articles, is it reports, what are people sharing? Um, everything. And some, interestingly, quite a lot of the things they're sharing, they're doing so well. This is not a research-based answer, so let me be cautious. And my anecdotal impression is that some of what they're sharing is illegal in the sense of they don't know which version they could be sharing or should be sharing. And so some of the work we're doing is actually introducing people to things like Sherpa Romeo and showing them what is possible. Some of the advocacy work is around negotiations with publishers to ensure that they have Creative Commons licenses and have the right to share. Um, for some people, starting with research is less frightening than starting with teaching resources, and for some people it's the other way around. So it varies a lot. And as I said, the disciplinary dimension can't be underplayed. For some disciplines, Journal articles are not really the most important thing. Computer scientists tell me we only publish in journals if we can't get into conferences. So it varies. We're also encouraging the sharing of popular resources. So I don't have the facts and figures in the way that you're asking, but it really varies a lot. touched on this now the reference to property resources. Because I'm trying to work out on what basis do you distinguish between resources that are made available on the open UCT initiative and those that are made available through a third-party provider like GetSmarter? GetSmarter has been used in the university for online courses. So as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, UCT has not actually been involved with online courses per se to date. I think it's only honestly with the rise of MOOCs that this has really hit the university. In fact, when I first started working at the university, anything that sounded like distance education was a no-no. 
the, the environment's changed a lot. Health sciences used to do courses that they didn't really talk about that much. Nowadays, they're, they're quite rightfully quite proud of them because they've got some very good experience there. But that online space is a very new space. And I think GetSmart has been very smart. They've actually identified a niche. 